Well, good morning, everyone. How are you? <laughs> it's so good to be here with you. If you don't know me, my name's Dan Palmer, and I, I guess the way I would describe myself is I grew up here. My pastor's sitting right there, Pastor Ted Smith. Give him a huge round of applause. Uh, I grew up here. I came back after seminary and was a college pastor here, and then... Uh, when Jesse was voted in as the new senior pastor, uh, he called me to come be his executive teaching pastor, and I was here for a while. And then the last two years, I've been leading uh, a ministry called Youth for Christ in Sacramento. And uh, I just want to start off just saying, sometimes it's important for us to take a moment and just thank God for the blessing that he's given us. And this church is an incredible blessing in my life, and I hope it is in yours as well. So let's just thank God for this place. You know, when I go out into the city as a missionary for Youth for Christ, from here, this is my foundation. This is the place I come back and I know it's home. I know that I'm loved. I know that I can be encouraged and challenged and lifted up as I do the work that God's called us to do. And that's why I think we're so lucky to have a church like this. We serve here. We give here. We care here. We lift scripture high. Uh, we obey what that scripture says, which sometimes is the most difficult part. We love the people around us. We go to the ends of the earth. And it really is an honor to be with you here today. We've been taking breaks in our normal sermon series to cover some of the essential characteristics of the Christian life. And uh, the essentials are a few of the things that our hope is that every one of you would institute into your lives in some way. And Pastor Jesse has been covering these intermittently over the last few months, things like other places and group life and equipping. And you can go to the website and you can hear Pastor Jesse talking about those other essentials. Today, we're talking about the essential of serving in the kingdom of believers. Uh, and the fact is that serving is a powerful, transformative tool in our lives for two reasons, really. First of all, serving is a powerful, transformative tool because serving changes us. When we make a decision that we're going to serve in Jesus' name, it connects us with God because God is the, the leader, the humble king, the leader of a kingdom that's built on the foundation of serving and giving your life for other people. When we serve others, it forces us to trust God. It gets us out of our comfort zone and drives us to our knees in prayer for him to empower us to do his work. When we serve others, it humbles us because it forces us in this society that constantly tells us, put yourself on the top, always look out for number one. And when we serve others, we say, no, you are valuable and I will humble myself and I'll put you first. It humbles us puts us where we should be. Serving also changes us because when we serve, it engages us in kingdom work and it inspires us. You know, we can get caught up in the rat race of this world, living for ourselves, trying to build our own little kingdoms, but our souls sometimes need to look up and realize that God is so great and he is so big and we are a small part of his story and that story will continue after we're gone to his glory and his renown. I compare it to when we get caught up in the busyness of this life and we look out on the ocean and we see the vastness and hear the waves crashing in or we, we look up at the stars at night and we realize the vastness of the world that we live in and it humbles us and we can find our joy again. The world doesn't revolve around us. It engages us in kingdom work. It inspires us. It connects us to something bigger than ourselves and something that will last well beyond this life. When we serve, it changes us. Second reason why it's a powerful transformative tool in our lives is because serving impacts others. It really does. Do you remember the moments in your life when someone served you? Whew, man, there's so many for me. And quite frankly, I never would have become a pastor. I would never be the, the husband or father that I am now if it wasn't for all of the people that have served me and invested in my life with no possibility of gain for themselves. My first memory of being served by this church was when I was a kid, you know, my dad, when I was six, my dad left. And so we grew up very poor, single mom, six kids. My mom took a job as the, the, um, the secretary to the driver's ed department at Elk Grove High School because she had 
three boys and three adopted girls, and two of them were drug babies, and so there was, she needed the medical care. <laughs> so the pay was terrible, but man, I can cover six kids with medical care, so I'll do it. So we had nothing. I was with my brother as he's recovering from cancer this week, and we were laughing about all the things we did because we didn't have any money when we were kids. He literally made his own skateboard out of a block of wood. And then to try to make it cool, he nicknamed it the Ark. And everyone's like, I want the Ark. And it was just the worst skateboard ever, but he made it cool because he had to, because that's what we had to do. We had generic stuff all over our house. And when Christmas came, which we were as excited about Christmas as any other kid on earth, every year we would get one present. All six of us, we would get one present for Christmas. And we were excited about it. We weren't let down. But this one Christmas, I'll never forget it, there was a knock on our door early in the morning. We had our stockings and we were waiting to open our present. And there was a knock on the door and we opened the door and it was the Sparts and Crandall families from this church. And they had decided for some reason that they were gonna provide us Christmas. And they showed up at our door. We had no idea. We opened the door and they had baskets of food. They had presents galore. Steve was there with a bunch of presents they brought into our house and I got like six or seven presents that day. And through my life, that might, I don't know why they did that. I don't know why God put that on their heart, but they served us. And for the rest of my life, I remember the generosity and the care and the love of a church for the brothers and sisters of Christ. Powerful moment for me. Another moment I remember when I was 16 years old trying to figure out what it means to be a man. Uh, two men from this church, Rick Red and Al Foster, were taking their sons on a backpacking trip. And I don't know why they did it. In my mind, it's always been because they knew I didn't have a dad around and they wanted to let me experience it. It might've been just because I was friends with their sons, but they invited me on a father-son backpacking trip. And I was so excited. And we packed up our backpacks and we went out. And I remember walking up to Rick and I had this big bag of trail mix. And I'm 16. I'm like, hey, Rick, I've never done this before. Is this enough trail mix for this trip? And he looked at it and he's like, oh man, that's enough for 10 trips. But I was 16. An hour later, I'd eaten the entire bag, and it was day one. And I'm like, uh-oh, I'm in big trouble. And we made our first stop, and Scott Foster, uh, Al's son, was exhausted. He's like, I don't think I can go on. And Rick and Al said, let us rearrange your pack. And so they, they start taking, he was awkward about it. I didn't know why. And they started unpacking. They found out he had a 12-pack of Dr. Pepper in his backpack. <laughs> But the moment I remember is when we're sitting around the campfire at the end of the week and they said, hey, you know, we've spent a week with you and, and you're smart and you're charismatic and if you're willing to work hard, you could really do something with your life. And you know what my response was? Do you really think so? Because no man had ever told me that before. And they served me and without that, I probably never would have gone to UCLA might not have never gone to graduate school, might not even be a pastor, but the serving impacts people around us. When I was in graduate, or, uh, graduate school, I was working at a church in Long Beach and Pastor Ted called me about coming and becoming the, the college pastor and leading college and celebration here. And they wanted me right away, but my wife had one more semester and I said, I, I can't come if the job's still available. I would want nothing more than to come home. And he said, oh, well, we'll hold it then. And so here I am, I go to my church and I say, hey, I can't come on full time even though I finished school because I'm going home and you need to know that. And they said, well, we'll keep you on part time, but we can't bring you full time. But I was done with school. I need to work full time. So I went to a business leader in the church and I said, hey, will you hire me on as a part time worker in your factory? He had an air conditioning business. I'll work there, you know, two 10 hour shifts a week so that I can still keep doing my youth ministry on the other days. And he looked at me and he said, you know what? Working in my company is a waste of your time. God has called you to be a minister in the lives of young people. I'll tell you what, I will pay you the money for all of those hours every week if you invest in our kids. And once a month, he'd bring a check to me and slide it over to me. And I'm like, this is crazy. And I think if he didn't serve me in that way, would I have ever joined a nonprofit where I have to raise money? Because it showed me the generosity of God's people. Serving impacts others. Serving is a powerful tool, both on the giving and receiving ends. And so I asked you this morning, how are you doing? Are you serving others? Are you looking for ways within the body of believers to make an impact on those around you? Trust me, the opportunities are endless, but are your eyes open to see it? 
I want to talk about some principles of serving. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Mark chapter 10. If you don't have your Bible, you can reach under the seat in front of you. There should be a Bible there. That's our gift to you as a church. Take it home, start in the Gospels and read it. Uh, but I want, to, I want to focus on Mark 10 verse 45. This is what Jesus says. The first principle of serving is that when we serve others, we follow the example of Jesus himself. In Mark 10, 45, he said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, trust me, when Jesus said this, this was just as much of a paradigm shift then as it is today. When Jesus said the Son of Man, the Messiah, the ruler of Israel, didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, he created a new sort of kingdom. I call it the upside-down kingdom. It's the kingdom that's flipped on his head where those that are great are humbled and those that are humbled are exalted and elevated where servers are the ones who are honored and those who seek their own glory are dishonored. And you know, the kingdom still exists today. We live in a world and even as church people, we buy into the idea of the kingdoms of this world. In the kingdom of this world, people receive honor through titles and wealth and accomplishments. But in the upside-down kingdom, in the new paradigm of Jesus, people are honored when they serve and lay their life down for other people. In this world, in this kingdom, people seek revenge and payback for evil or personal slights. But in the upside-down kingdom of Jesus, in the new paradigm, Jesus says, forgive your enemies and bless those who curse you. And how glory, how glory, glory that is, because we were his enemies once. And he forgave us. In this world's kingdom, we seek wealth, possessions, and prestige. But in the upside down kingdom, in the new paradigm, Jesus' true wealth comes from generosity and giving to the poor. And you know, we need to learn this today, of course, but the disciples also needed to learn it. The disciples didn't know it, they were living in the world, and he taught them and taught them and taught them. And so, if you know me, you know I love God's word. And you know that I like to look at the big picture of God's word. So if this isn't your thing, just bear with me for five minutes. If this is your thing, track along with me. Because what I want to do is I want to look at Mark 8.45, but I want to look at it in context. And I want to look at it in the context of Jesus trying to teach his disciples about this new kingdom idea. This servant leadership model, this upside down kingdom, this new paradigm where he's saying, don't be like the kingdoms of this world, but be a part of my kingdom. And if you look at the passage... You see in Mark chapter 8, Jesus feeds a multitude of people, and he shows the power of the upside-down kingdom. They can't feed the multitude, but through the power of God, a miracle happens, and all of their needs are met, and they feed the multitude. And right afterwards, Jesus says, beware the yeast of the Pharisees. Beware the people that speak about spiritual things but have no power because it's about them, and the disciples just don't get it. He says to them, do you not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see or ears that can't hear? In verse 21 of chapter 8, he says, do you still not understand? You're in the wrong kingdom. Right after that, he heals a blind man at Bethsaida. And in this healing, it's the only time in scripture where Jesus has to do a double healing. I don't think it's because he lacked power. I think it was a teaching tool. And so he meets this blind man, he spits in his eyes. Imagine that, it's kind of disgusting. But he spits in this dude's eyes. Thank you, Jesus. You know, he spits in his eyes and he goes, can you see now? And this blind guy goes, I can kind of see, but people look like trees. They're walking around. You see him, And then Jesus touches his eyes again and his sight is completely healed and he can see clearly. It's a double healing. And this passage is where it is because that's exactly what's happening with the disciples. He's telling them what it means to be a part of this upside down kingdom and they can kind of see it, but not really. And you see, because the next passage is Peter's confession of Christ, where Jesus says, who do the people say I am? They say, they, you're Moses or Elijah or one of them. Who do you say I am? You're the Christ. He partially sees, but he doesn't know what the Christ means. He thinks the Christ is going to be the ruling leader of Psalm chapter 2 or Daniel chapter 2 who's going to sit on David's throne and rule the nations in power. But Jesus is the Messiah of Isaiah 53, the suffering servant who lays himself down for his people. And so they partially see people are walking around like trees. You're the Messiah. I don't know what it means though. Right after Peter's confession where he partly sees you're the Christ, 
Look at verse 31 of chapter 8. Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And what happens? Peter takes him aside and rebukes him. No, you're not. You're going to sit on the throne, he partially sees. He doesn't understand the upside-down kingdom. The next passage, Jesus is transfigured. They see him in his glory, and they hear the voice of God praising him. And this makes it even more confusing, because now they've seen him in his glory. And at the end of that section, Jesus says, don't tell anyone about it until I rise again from the dead. And it says right there in the passage, they went away and they kept it to themselves, but they kept discussing, what does he mean by rising from the dead? They still don't get it. They don't understand what Jesus came to do. Jesus is trying to teach them about the upside down kingdom, but they don't get it. Look at verse 30. They left the place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be betrayed in the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. And then what's the next section? Jesus comes up on them in a deep discussion, and they're embarrassed. Why? Because they're arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom of God. They still don't get it. They're living by the world's rules. Jesus says, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. I'm going to move a little bit ahead just for the sake of time. But in Mark chapter 10, verse 31, you see again, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. And once again, Jesus says, I'm going to die. I'm going to be turned over to the religious leaders. They're going to kill me. And what's the next passage? Verse 35 of chapter 10. Then James and John came to him, teacher, do whatever we ask of you. Well, what do you want me to do, said Jesus? When you sit in your glory, let one of us sit on your right and one at your left. Are you seeing the pattern? If these people that walked with Jesus, if these people that saw him, watched him interact with people, watched him humble himself, couldn't get that they needed a shift in how they viewed power and control and leadership in this world, how much more do we need to receive it? Jesus says this to their request. Verse 42, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For, because, here's the example, because even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the example of Jesus. The upside down kingdom, the kingdom of King Jesus demands service. Not only is it the entryway into the kingdom, but it's the foundation of all greatness in the kingdom of God. Jesus was the greatest servant of all, and thus he's the most worthy of praise. And so when we serve, we follow the example of Jesus. Second principle of serving is that when we serve, we heed the warning of Jesus. I'm going to talk real quick about a passage of scripture that many of us know. It's from Matthew 25. It's called the parable of the sheep and the goats. But it's probably one of the most misunderstood passages in all of scripture. And most preachers don't really preach about it from the stage because it's so easy to misinterpret. It's saying, hey, whatever you do for poor people, that's what gets you in or out of heaven. And that flies in the face of all the theology of the entire Bible. We are only saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that is it. You cannot add or detract from it. And so it's a confusing passage because we don't see it in the context of what Jesus is talking about. And so I want to talk about the context. In Matthew chapter 24, a new segment of scripture begins. Jesus has just blasted the religious leaders for not understanding the new paradigm of his kingdom. He blasts them. Matthew 23 is the harshest passage in all of scripture. And then Matthew 24, Jesus starts to say, this is what gonna, this is going to happen after I die, rise from the dead, and ascend to heaven. Here's the signs of the last days. And I don't know if you know it, because we live in comfort and ease here in America, but we are in the last days, just like the disciples were. We are supposed to be living our lives with the imminent return of Christ in mind, that we need to do whatever we can because Jesus can come back tomorrow. And this is one of the passage. Jesus lays out, he says, this is what's gonna happen. And then he goes into a section of five stories that are all built together to say, as you wait for the return of King Jesus, 
As you live in these last days and you wait for his return, wait like this. And you can see in chapter 24, verse 36, he says, when you wait for the Lord Jesus, when you wait for his return, wait like those who don't want to be surprised by his coming. And he says, it's going to be just like it was in Noah's day where people were eating and drinking and then the flood came and they were swept away. He said, in the same way, two men will be in a field, probably brothers or a father or son, and one will be taken and one will be left behind. Two women will be working with the grain, probably mother, daughter, or two sisters, and one will be taken and one will be left behind. So he said, that's what it's going to be like. So wait like those who don't want to be surprised. Second thing he says in verse 24, verse 45, he says, wait like stewards who will have to give account to their master of their service. He says, when the master leaves and he puts a servant in charge of, his, of the other servants, his brothers and sisters, don't be like the one that, that takes advantage of that opportunity and serves himself because the master will come back and see that you will be unfaithful and you won't be able to give a positive account of your service. Wait for Jesus like that. Third way we wait, he says, when we wait for Jesus, wait as those who know his master's coming might be long delayed. And many of you know the parable of the virgins where the virgins are there and they're waiting for the wedding to begin, but it's delayed. And some of them go and get extra oil so that they're prepared when the night comes, but other ones are too lazy and they're having fun chit-chatting. And it gets dark and their oil runs out and then the king returns and they miss the wedding banquet because they weren't prepared for it to be delayed. He said, wait for Jesus like that. We're 2,000 years into it. It's delayed, but it could be tomorrow. Jesus could return tomorrow. Are you ready? The next thing Jesus says as we wait for Jesus to return in these last days, wait as slaves who are commissioned to improve their master's assets. It's the par parable of the talents, many of you know. Talents often gets misconstrued as your abilities. That's not what it's talking about. The Greek word is talenton. It's a, it's a bag of gold. He said, so, so wait for the master as slaves that are commissioned to improve, to build on the master's kingdom. That's how we wait. We work to expand the kingdom in his assets, in his absence. He's given us assets and we need to expand them. One servant buries it and he gets condemned. The other one's expanded and they're blessed. And then the passage of the sheep and the goats. How do we wait? We wait as people whose lives are so transformed by the gospel that we unselfconsciously serve our brothers and sisters in Christ. Two things I want to focus on. First of all, this isn't talking about the poor everywhere. There's a million passages in scripture that say serve the poor. This is important to God and it absolutely is. But that's not what this passage is about. This passage is about how we serve other Christians within the body of Christ. They're the sheep and the goats. They're all part of the, the, the master's assets and he's going to divide them. Just like he divided the disciples from the Pharisees. Just like the two people milling grain were separated. Just like everyone was servants and one was praised and one wasn't. This is specific to the body of Christ. That's what this is talking about. So first of all, brothers and sisters. Secondly, unselfconsciously. If you know this story, he comes and he takes the goats who are the ones that are going to be cast outside the kingdom. And he says, I was naked in prison. You didn't come to me. I was hungry. You didn't feed me. I was thirsty. You gave me nothing to drink. And they say, when? We don't remember ever doing that. And Jesus says, as much as you've not done it for the least of my brothers of mine, you've not done it for me. And then the sheep, he says, come into the kingdom that's prepared for you. For I was hungry and you gave, I was thirsty. And he goes through the whole thing. And they say, when? They don't know either. When? When did we serve like that? It was unselfconscious. You were so ingrained into this new kingdom that it flowed naturally. I want to challenge you with this, this morning, with this passage. How do we treat Christians who are out on the front lines serving the Lord? How do we encourage them? How do we take some time to step back and say, man, we praise Pastor Jesse and Pastor Mark for all the people they're, they're reaching in the world, but have I paused a second to think about them? How I can serve them as they make sacrifice after sacrifice with their family and with their time and with their ability to encourage and lift them up? Man, I'm so excited when the youth pastor has a room full of people. That's awesome. But can I take my focus off the people for a second and think about the youth pastor who's given his entire life to reach outside the walls of the church? And what about the missionary? Where's your fruit? Where's the results? Can I take a step back from that and say you left everything to go? 
Within the body of Christ, how can we serve and lift people up? Here's a kid without a father. Can I take him on a father-son trip? Here's a family that has no resources. Can we bless them at Christmas? How do we love each other as a family? And when God returns, he says, when I see that, oh, come into the kingdom prepared for you because you unselfconsciously are a part of this upside-down kingdom, this new paradigm that I've created. Principle of the kingdom of God is we heed his warning. And lastly, we serve with eternity in mind. You know, every person we meet, we look at people with spiritual eyes rather than physical eyes. This world says, look at the color of your skin. Look at how many resources you have. Look at what you've accomplished. And God says, look that each person is made in the image of God. They are eternal beings. You know, America one day will be no more, just like the Roman Empire and the Greek Empire were no more. But the person sitting next to you in this room will exist for eternity either with God or apart from God. The person sitting next to you is infinitely more important than Rome. Think about that for a second. They are a soul made in the image of God that will endure forever. And so we, when we serve people, we serve with eternity in mind. Maybe someone's broken. This world has done a number on them, but they're still made in the image of God and we can impact their life. We see the innate dignity in others because they're created in the image of God. We know that salvation comes from the finished work of Jesus and not from any work of our own, so we humbly serve with no superiority towards anyone else. We need Jesus just as much as they do. Paul says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. We serve with eternity in mind. That's what at stake. That's what's at stake. This is the day of salvation. This is our chance as we await the master's return to make an impact out in the world and right there within our own body. I'm going to put up Rick Warren's five principles. Uh, I don't have time to go over them, but I really liked them and they're in your notes, so I encourage you to study them. I want to end with this. Can we all make a commitment here as the body of believers, the brothers and sisters of King Jesus? That's what he calls us. My mother and my brothers are those who do the will of my father. We are the, the, the brothers and sisters of Jesus himself. Can we make a commitment to embrace his kingdom, to love each other? Can we commit to serving in the body of Christ? Can we obey Jesus and follow his example by spending our time and our talents and our money on brothers and sisters who are struggling to minister in Jesus' name? Can we embrace the upside down kingdom so much that we become like Jesus and unselfconsciously help our brothers and sisters? That Sunday school teacher who's leading your kid what can you do to say thanks to them, to encourage them not to give up? It's hard. Your youth pastor, your kids have went through. How can you encourage them and lift them up and stay in the battle, brother, stay in the battle, sister? How can we build each other up so that all of us continue to expand God's kingdom as we wait for his return? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to study your word and to grow by it. I want to be like you. There's so many examples in this world of people that I emulate that are powerful and have leadership and have accomplishments. But my heart desires just to be like you, Jesus, to lay my life down for other people. Thank you for this church and what you're building here and what you're doing here. May we be a true community of love that's meeting the needs of the people around us and impacting their lives in a real way. Be with us, God, as we serve you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Art. Everyone, we really do believe that serving helps us grow in our relationship with Christ. Um, what I'm about to say is not just a, a ploy for us to try to get more volunteers. It's really about our spiritual growth. I know for me personally, when I am really serving in areas where I don't need to be, where it's not my job, I know that that so often is what causes spiritual growth in my life. And so we really want you to understand, uh, we want us all to get that this really isn't essential for the Christian life, is a way for us to, to find a way to serve for each one of us in our own abilities with our own gifts. So we want to talk about a couple practical things before we go today. If you have your phone, which most of you do, you can get it out right now and go on to uh, the River City Christian app, or you can even get online. And we want to tell you about a couple opportunities. First of all, on the app, if you just go to connect and go to volunteer, there's a list 
listing there of a variety of ways that you can serve the church family on a regular basis as an usher or a greeter, or maybe you've thought about joining the choir, uh, or you want to help out in hospitality. There's just a variety of ways that you can serve uh, on a regular basis. But we also want to talk about uh, an incredible event coming up, and that is our Christmas Mall. And you know that we're going to be having about a 1,000 people in need from our community coming onto our church campus. And this is a great opportunity for us to share the love of Jesus Christ with many of these people who do not yet know the Lord. And there are all kinds of ways that you can help out with that. You can help sort merchandise ahead of the event. You can uh, be someone who hands out candy canes to little kids out front. I mean, that doesn't really take, uh, you know, any kind of degree of, of expertise at all. Anybody can do that. You can work in a store. You could really help us out by helping in child care because we always have a great need for child care during that event. Uh, we also need people to work in the salon. Uh, there's many other things that you could do. You can sign up for that on the app, or if you have questions, you can go and talk to somebody uh, right now uh, out at the uh, Christmas Mall booth that is in the lobby, and they would be glad to answer any questions and get you signed up. Again, we want you to grow in your faith. We all want to grow in our faith. And to do that, serving is one of those essentials that we need to all be involved in. Amen? Amen. I think you could do better than that. Amen? Amen? That's awesome. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week.